What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Street Parking Podcast. My name is Miranda Alcaraz. I am the co-founder here at Street Parking. And if you're new to this podcast or to this community, Street Parking is an online program and community for people to take control of their health and fitness using simple tools. And even if you identify as somebody who has not a lot of time, not a lot of equipment, not a lot of money, not a lot of space. We are here to help you take control of your health and fitness here at Street Parking. Today's episode is about accountability, which I feel is just kind of a buzzword and has been for quite some time now. But that's what we're talking about in today's episode. It is one of our core values. We're going to talk about why it's one of our core values and how we view this kind of buzzy word accountability. Have you ever noticed the tendency that we have as human beings when we are successful or when we're good at something or when something goes our way? Have you ever noticed the tendency that we have to say, oh yeah, like I did that, I worked really hard, I did this and that, and and I nailed it. And then when something goes wrong, the tendency that we have to look outside of ourselves to say, well, I was doing really, really good, but then this happened. Or, well, I would have placed better in the race, or I would have done better at my job, or I would have been a better mom today if X, Y, Z didn't happen. It's not my fault. Have you ever noticed the tendency that we have to do that? I think it might be some part of the human condition, or for sure the way that our culture and our society is wired, has us all leaning in that direction. And then On the flip side, what I've noticed is that we also seem to have a tendency when other people fail, when other people don't do a good job, when they lose the game, when they don't get the promotion, we have a tendency to flip that and think, well, yeah, they should have done this or they could have done that. They didn't train as hard as they should have been. They didn't take it as seriously. And we tend to blame, put the blame all on the person who, quote unquote, failed. And then when a person succeeds or does really, really well or has um, a really fit body or is really successful in their job or their career, is it a really amazing, like Pinterest worthy mother? We have a tendency to say, oh, well, they're so lucky. That person, they, they, they have things, they're lucky, they have this level of support, or they have these genetics, or th- their parents gave them this, and they didn't really achieve or um, earn what they have. They're just really lucky. Isn't it interesting how we do that? Something that I thought about a lot as I was preparing this podcast episode. When I was early in street parking, I used to spend a lot of time listening to a podcast by someone that mo- many of you have probably heard of, uh, Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk, who was like, he started with Wine Library and now he's this big business podcaster talking about um, how to grow your business and how to utilize social media and, and all sorts of stuff. He's famous if you're on that side of things. And one of the things that I really liked that he said and that he would repeat often in his podcast episodes or or in the articles that I would read back then was, everything is my fault. Everything is my fault. And in his content, he would usually talk about in his business. So one of the examples that he would give a lot of the time is if I have employees that I struggle with who are not performing, who are complaining, who have a bad attitude, whatever... It's not their fault. It's my fault. I hired these people. I set the culture and the tone here at, um, I can't even remember the name of his business now. Um, I, you know, I hired the people who trained them, all of it. So at the end of the day, everything here is my fault. And I really liked that. And that might sound like, wow, like you can't put that all on yourself, Gary V. But he says, when you hold yourself accountable, it leads to solutions. 
It helps you maintain a position of control instead of being a victim. So again, he talks about his employees and how he was employee number one. So everyone that came after him, he had control over that situation. So think about it. He says, think about it. If you make everything your fault in your life, with, and he encourages without beating yourself up, of course, then you are also the one person with the power to change things around. If nothing is my fault, then I have no control to change anything. If everything is my fault, then I have the power and I am the one person who holds all the control to fix it. And I really liked that from Gary Vee. Now, realistically, not everything is our fault, right? Um, Certainly, there are many things in our lives that happen to us that could not have been prevented, that um, maybe even happened to us when we were children or whatever. Uh, If you've followed along with me on social media or if you're a part of the street parking community and you've been here for a while, you might know that this past year... uh, My family went through something which uh, is not something that we're going to dive into on this podcast episode, but we had a trauma that happened to us, and I found myself in a two-week-long, they call it trauma camp, but it was basically like some cabins in the woods in Kentucky where myself and nine other people in my group came there to get some help with the things that we were going through because we were all involved in some sort of trauma. Now, they had us tell our life story, okay, and all the things that had had happened to us or that we had done or just things that might have contributed to where we are today and the struggles that we're in today. And as I got, we spent about three days listening to everyone's stories, and let me tell you, not everything that has put you in the position in your life today that makes your life hard is your fault. The stories that I heard from these people and the things that happened to them when they were children and, and like little, like babies to, you know, all the way to where we're at today, many of us have things that happen, large things that have happened or small things that have happened on the day to day that are absolutely not our fault. So where I love what Gary Vee said Realistically, not everything is our fault. Another author that I love so much and we, and we talk about a lot in the street parking community is James Clear. He adds a little bit to what Gary Vee might say, and he can be quoted as saying, not everything in our lives is our fault, good or bad. Many things happen to us. However, everything in our lives is our responsibility. So even the things that happened to us that we had no control over still fall in our lap as our responsibility. Nathaniel Brandon, who is a Canadian-American psychologist who's known for his work in self-esteem, said this, no one is coming to save me. No one is coming to make life right for me. No one is coming to solve my problems if I don't do something Nothing is going to get better. So we can, we, we can look at both of those things and we can have two things be true at once. Not everything and not every problem, not even like the small annoying things that happen in our daily life are, are our fault, but they are, all, they are all our responsibility. Um, if you're somebody who follows Stoicism or Stoics, people like Seneca Epictetus or Marcus Aurelius. These are like from hundreds of years ago, philosophers and deep thinkers. They talked about the original circles of control. And many of us have seen this before, but I'll kind of paint the diagram here for you. The circles of control are the two circle diagram that we've probably all seen, where there's a small circle that says things that are in my control and then a bigger circle around that, a much bigger circle around that that says things that are out of my control. And we are encouraged to list all of the things in our lives that are absolutely within our control, list all of the things in our lives that are absolutely out of our control, and focus on what is in our control. And this is where the circles of control come from. Happiness and freedom begin with a clear understanding of one principle. Some things are within our control and some things are not. Ryan Holiday, who is an author that studies Stoicism and he writes about the Stoics a lot, 
said, we are all faced with challenges, with difficult situations and circumstances. We deal with difficult people, challenges with our health, our finances, our relationships. We all, every person, no one is immune to the struggles in life. What do you control? According to him, there are two things that we can control in our life and that we have complete and utter control of, our thoughts and our actions. That's it. Nothing else is in our control. So our approach to life should be to work on the things that are in our control and let go of everything else. I'm here to tell you guys that I am probably, out of everyone listening or watching this, on the far side of letting go of things that are out of my control is really hard for me. And so this is something that I've been working on and something that's hard for me to hear because I am the type of person that wants to try to control everything. It reminds me going back to when I was at the Bridge to Recovery, that's the trauma treatment place that I was in in Kentucky. Um, Every day we said the serenity prayer. I think we said it twice. And this is a almost 100, it was written in the early 1930s. It's almost 100 years old now that you hear at uh, like Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, Narcotic Anonymous meetings, but really used in, in many practices when it comes to therapy or mental health. And it really talks about this idea of what's in my control and what's out of my control. So the serenity prayer is, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Accept the things I can't change. That's everything in that circle that's in the big circle, which is most things, according to Ryan Holiday and the Stoics, everything other than my thoughts and my actions are completely out of my control. So allow me to accept those things and then change the things that I can and the wisdom to know the difference. In 2024, all it takes is a few minutes in the comments section of your favorite social media app or platform to see that um, most of our culture and the people within it spend a lot of time worrying, arguing <laughs> about things that are completely out of our control and in many cases don't even impact us at all. Things that we're concerned about but largely cannot affect and a great deal of time on things, again, that shouldn't even be our concern. In 2024, the amount of time that most people spend on that outer circle and not on the inner one, you can see it very quickly with just a few scrolly scrolls and 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 one comment section. We spend so much of our precious mental and emotional energy on these things, leaving little time or energy for the things we can impact and can actually change in our lives. So let's talk about those circles really quick, the two circles, what's in my control and what's out of my control, and just a really brief, quick list. And as you guys are listening to this, if you're walking your dog or you're driving or you're you know, doing the street parking endurance workout, try to think of what your list is. And quite honestly... If you're a human being, what's in your control, our lists aren't going to be vastly different. Because again, according to Ryan Holiday and the Stoics, there are two things, our attitude, our our, our thoughts slash attitude, and our actions. So attitude and thoughts are in my control, and then simple daily actions, not even every daily action, but simple daily actions are within my control. On, and these are going to vary how much control or what that looks like for each of us. But on some level, we all have control of the following. If I move daily. Now, listen to me. Don't go to the comments section and talk to me about the very small percentage of people that have absolutely no choice when it comes to... We're talking to the majority, the general public here, okay? So I understand there are exceptions to everything. But for... of us or whatever, we have some level of control of whether or not we intentionally move daily in the form of some sort of form of exercise. Most of us on some level have some control of our food choices. Most people do have a choice of the Chick-fil-A drive-thru or going to the grocery store. Not everyone on planet Earth, but I'm assuming if you're listening to this, that you fall into that category. 
most of us, again, the majority of people and people listening to this have control over how much water they drink. We have control over how much time we spend on social media. Not always true and not true in every case, but in many areas, we have control over who we allow in our life or at least who we allow to speak into our life and whose advice we take versus who we kind of, yeah, that's, you know, we can't, we didn't get to choose our family of origin. We might not get to choose our coworkers, but we get to choose how much they influence us and what we take on from them, how much time we spend with some of these people. And then certainly when it comes to our chosen social circles, we get to choose those things. I get to choose what I buy at the grocery store and therefore have in my home. That's not true for my six-year-old, but it is true for me. And so at some point when we're, give, we're handed the reins of our own life, these are the type of choices we get to make. I get to choose what podcasts, books, etc., that I allow into my brain. And I get to choose how I spend my free time. I might not get to choose how much free time I have, but if I have some, I get to choose if that's spent on Netflix, if I add an extra fitness into it, if I sleep, if I listen to a podcast, if I read, if I go back to college, whatever. Might be 30 minutes of free time for some people. It might be hours a day. I remember when I used to have hours a day of free time, and I definitely had a choice for how I was going to choose it. All of these, and that's, this is not an exhaustive list, but you guys can start to see these things are all within our control. My thoughts, attitudes, and actions, my behaviors are largely within my control. So what's out of our control then? And I like actually that in, in many of the diagrams that you see now, this circle is a circle of concern because it can, we can look at it and see, oh, well, let it go. It's out of your control. Just let it go. And for me, I'm like, well, these things like matter to me. Other people matter to me, like the environment or, you know, some people are really into politics or some people are really into, I don't know, their favorite sports team and they can't control whether their sports team wins, but... We're not telling you not to be concerned about it. So this circle in many of the diagrams is actually called the circle of concern. It's okay for you to be concerned about it, but let go of the fact that you cannot control it in many cases. So what's in my out of control circle or circle of concern? Number one thing that I put on my list was people, people in general, my boss, my husband, people in traffic, people on the internet, in, the, in those comment sections, the people I work with, my kids. We cannot control other people, what they do, what they say, what they think about us, um, how they respond to us, the comments that they leave. For the most part, other people are completely out of our control. Another thing that's out of my control, going back to the stories that I heard at the Bridge to Recovery in this incredible group of humans um, that I was there with, was my past. I can't go back and change anything that I've done that's been done to me, choices that I've made from my past. And so much of our time is spent thinking about that. I can't control my parents or my family of origin. I can't control the habits that may have been... I can't control the fact that certain habits were passed down to me from those people. Now, I can change these things, which we'll get into, but I wasn't in control over whether what I was taught was proper eating or what my attitude was toward exercise or any of that. I can't change my past mistakes. I can't change my past hurts or trauma or anything that's impacted me that has made me the person that I am today. I wrote on here daylight savings time because as of the time of recording this, it was yesterday and um, it's thrown our schedule at home all the way off. I can't control that. I, I can think that it's dumb. I can think that it's pointless. I can be mad that it's like, messed up the schedule with my three children, but I can't change that it's a thing here in the United States where I live. I can't control the weather. If I could, it would not be raining outside as we're recording this. It would be sunny and 75 degrees. I can't control wars, pandemics, a lot of government things, politics, all of that stuff. I can't control most tragedies, death of a loved one, my best friend being diagnosed with cancer, my kid getting, you know, uh, in some sort of car accident. And the final one that I put on here, which we're going to circle back to because at street parking, our main focus is on your health and your fitness is my genetics. I can't control that my DNA, 
I can't control who my parents were and what they gave me and, and how that my body was put together as a result of that. We're going to circle back to that one. So I like this. I like focus on what you can control, which is a very small bubble, which is great because um, the list is not very long. And I can always, okay, this is bothering that, me, that's bothering me, the freaking daylight savings time, but what can I control? Well, I could try setting an alarm or I could just let go of it and let the schedule be chaos or I have choices, but focusing on the fact that that is, is not going to change anything. More modern day psychologists have added a third circle to this two circle idea. And I love this so, so much. And so you've got the small circle of what I can absolutely control my thoughts and behaviors. You've got the big circle on the outside of things that are completely out of my control, which is most things in the world. There's a middle circle that's like a medium size that's a bigger than the, what I can control, smaller than the out of my control. And this is the circle of influence. In the circle of influence, my efforts may heavily influence the outcome or not much, but in this circle are things that I can influence for the better or for the worse um, through work, effort, and consistency. Some, uh, a small list of things that I put within the circle of influence then are I can influence my mood and my mental health. I've got a little section here in a little bit where we'll talk about depression, but we can influence. I can't necessarily just snap out of it. And I don't, I don't like it when um, authors or podcast hosts or whatever are just like, just choose to be happy. And it's like, well, that's nice. But I can do things that will influence it. I can, I can focus on the negative or focus on the positive. And the same is true for many mental health concerns. I can influence my fitness level. Now, why isn't my fitness level in that circle of control? Well, because part of that comes down to how much time I have, how much money I have, how much equipment I have, and also my genetic makeup. So, but I can heavily influence what my fitness level is in all the varying different areas through work, effort, and consistency. I can influence my body composition, my fat mass, my muscle mass. Now, let's not kid ourselves here. If someone out there were to do exactly what I do or exactly what Coach Molly does or exactly what Julian does and followed exactly what we eat and trained exactly the way that we train and did it for a long time, would they end up with the exact same fitness level, exact same body composition, fat mass, lean mass? Absolutely not. Because, again, we go back to the genetic makeup. However, it would be crazy for us to think that if we all found that level of consistency that we wouldn't see an improvement. There would be an influence from those lifestyle factors that would get me, that a change would definitely be made. I can influence my schedule by being, (laughs) this is me, right, of being a more organized person, uh, planning better, trying to set better um, habits in my own home with my own children or whatever. Maybe I quit my job that requires me to work 70 hours a week and I find something that allows me to work less and maybe that's a choice that I make and maybe I'm making less money, but I do have a choice and I can influence that stuff. As far as I know, nobody listening to this is forced to work the job that they have or anything like that. I can influence my sleep. Um, Some people might have this a little bit more heavily in their sphere of control. For me with little kids right now, I can't control if my child wakes up one time a night, four times a night, if all three of them are like in and out of our bedroom. But I can influence what type of sleep I get, how much sleep I get by having a better routine in the evening, by helping them to get better sleep and setting them up for success. I can influence my home life. I can't control my husband or my children, but I can, I can influence the environment in which we live by trying to create a more peaceful place. Same with work or stress. This circle of influence I love so much because what we're saying is, okay, I need to let go of what the outcome is going to be, but there are some work that I can do to improve this situation. I can't 100% control what happens, but I can control, again, going back into that circle of control, I can control my behaviors and influence some of this stuff that otherwise kind of felt completely out of my control. 
I want to go back to genetics because I also put in your circle of influence, I would move your genetics in most situations and when it comes to most things in, in your genetic profile as not out of your control and not in that out of your control circle, but in the circle of influence. Let's see here. I wrote down the name of the person who first said this. Okay, American obesity researcher George Bray was the first person, you guys may have heard this quote before, was the first person to say, genetics load the gun, environment or lifestyle pulls the trigger. Genetics load the gun, but environment or lifestyle pulls the trigger. George Bray said that. Genes have been said to impact everything from the obvious things, our hair color, our eye color, how tall we are, those all come from our genetic makeup, to our likelihood to develop certain kinds of certain diseases, to even our personalities or our mental health issues can have been on some level tied back to our genetics, our parents, their parents, the whole thing, right? We're learning more and more that these things that we have long believed are out of our control in that outside circle because of our genes are actually much more in our circle of influence than we realize. I did some deep diving. I did some research in preparation for this podcast to back up this belief that I have, or this, I I know it because I've seen it. I've been in the fitness industry for over 20 years and I've seen this play out over and over again, but let's back it up with the, with obesity, um, genes and obesity, Harvard school of public health. Okay, so at the Harvard School of Public Health, they talked about genes and obesity. It's, it's an article that I read. And they said, genes influence every aspect of human physiology, development, and adaptation. And obesity is no exception. Obesity is one of those things where we hear it all the time in our industry. I'm overweight because my parents are overweight. I, I'm genetically predisposed to being, to being obese. Um, However, according to this article, genetic changes are unlikely to explain the rapid spread of obesity around the globe. That's because the gene pool, the frequency of different genes across a population remains fairly stable for many generations. It takes a long time for new mutations to spread. So if our genes have stayed largely the same, what has changed over the past 40 years of rising obesity rates? Our environment is the thing that has changed. The physical, social, political, and economic surroundings that influence how much we eat and how active we are is what has changed in the past 40 years. Environmental changes that make it easier for people to overeat, harder for people to get enough physical activity, have played a key role in triggering the recent surge of overweight and obesity. They go on in the article to talk about studies that have been done because they have been looking for, because we've long called obesity a genetic problem. And so researchers have gone looking for, well, what is the exact gene? And I don't, I I am far from the scientist that understands how they do all these things, but researchers have gone looking for specific genes that might trigger or might increase the likelihood or make it impossible for somebody not to be obese. In 2008, There was a study that demonstrated that physical activity actually, so they've isolated these genes, I think a few of them, but there was one study in 2008 um, that demonstrated that physical activity actually offsets the effects of one of those obesity-promoting genes, a common variant of FTO. The study conducted in 17,058 Danes found that people who carried this obesity-promoting gene who were inactive did have higher BMIs than people without the gene variant who were also inactive. So they took this group of people. Some of them had this obesity-promoting gene. Some of them didn't. All of them were inactive. And the people who had the obesity-promoting gene, surprise, surprise, had a higher BMI than the people who didn't have the gene. However, having a genetic predisposition to obesity did not seem to matter for people who were active their BMIs were no higher or no lower than people who did not have the same or that obesity gene. So in that group, the people who were active, whether they had the obesity promoting gene or not, there was no difference in the BMI from the active group. 
In this same article, they say most people probably have some genetic predisposition to obesity. Most people probably have some predisposition to obesity, depending on their family history and ethnicity. Moving, however, from uh, from genetic predisposition to obesity itself requires some sort of change in diet, lifestyle, environmental factors, and some of these changes include the following. So you might have a predisposition, and according to Harvard, most people probably do, but for that to play out, it would be required for you to um, live a lifestyle that also promotes that gene to be triggered. Um, The ready availability of food at all hours of the day in places that once did not even sell food. I mean, you go to like Best Buy, and what's at the like? What's at the checkout counter at Best Buy? They got like two pound bags of M and M's there. You're like trying to buy a washer and dryer, and you're over here being sold Haribo frogs, um, such as gas stations, pharmacies, and even office supply stores. Uh, a dramatic g- decrease in physical activity during work, domestic activities, and leisure time, especially among children. That's a huge shift that we've seen in the last 40, 50 years is how much time we're spending in, in our cars, in our computers. Increased time spent watching television, using computers, and performing other sedentary activities. And, of course, the influx of highly processed foods, fast food, sugar-sweetened beverages, along with marketing campaigns that, of course, promote all of them because they're all trying to sell their stuff. Here's the good news. All of those things that are listed that would be required to trigger that obesity-promoting gene that, according to Harvard, most people probably have are within our circle of control. They're all behaviors of things that, on some level, we have control over how much of that stuff we allow into our lives. Diabetes is no different According to the CDC, one in three Americans are pre-diabetic. Pre-diabetes is a serious health condition where blood sugar levels are higher than normal, but not high enough yet to be diagnosed as type 2 diabetes. Also, according to the CDC, one in 10 Americans have diabetes, 95% of which are type 2. I did a little quick Google, is type 2 diabetes preventable? Because that's one of those things where it's like, oh, yeah, you know, everyone in my family has develops type 2 diabetes. It's genetic. I quick Google Google searched, is type 2 diabetes preventable? According to the CDC, yes, with an exclamation point. You can prevent or delay, at least delay, type 2 diabetes with proven achievable lifestyle changes such as losing a small amount of weight or getting more physically active, even if you are at high risk. And I love that it says prevent or delay. Because again, when we're looking at that circle of influence, I might not be able to prevent it entirely, but if I'm able to, as opposed to um, being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes at 30 years old, maybe I'm diagnosed at 60 years old because of my lifestyle and what I, and, and these things that are 100% or at least largely within my control, that's an influence that I had on my quality of life and on my health over my lifetime. Those ones are kind of, those are in the news a lot, or or we've read about that stuff. I think that stuff is becoming more common of, yeah, of course you can prevent or maybe even reverse type 2 diabetes. Obesity is, can be controlled on some level quite a bit. What about something like depression? I've spent a good amount of time talking to our good friends over at Between the Ears, Kariana and Bill Anthes, and because of the things that I've had going on in the last nine months, this one is a, is, is a really big, interesting one to me. What about mental health and, health and lifestyle factors? How much influence can I have on these things? Depression is a mood disorder that causes a persistent feeling of sadness, a loss of interest in things and activities you once enjoyed. It can also cause difficulty with thinking, memory, eating, and sleeping. And I'm just going to be super vulnerable with you guys. For the past eight months, yes, yes, check, check, check for me. Difficult, difficulty with thinking, 100%. Memory, eating, sleeping. And when I was researching depression and the causes of it, one of the, you know, they, they did say it can have genetic factors, brain chemistry, but also going back to that circle of things that are outside of my control, 
Depression can often be triggered by things that happen to us, whether that's childhood trauma or the loss of a spouse or a child, a miscarriage. Like These are real-life situations that are unavoidable, that are out of our control, that can trigger something, mental health issues like depression, which is very common in our society today. And it's a huge problem, and it's very sad. There are lots of different types of depression that I'm not going to go into, but according to... Um, I did not write down the website for this one, but according to my research, 15 to 20% of adults will experience depression at some point in their lifetime. Of course, we all probably know people who it's chronic and it's something that they battle lifelong. Researchers don't know the exact cause of depression. Um, and I, I listed a couple that were, that were in there. Now, when I looked at treatment for depression, of course, they're going to talk about cognitive and behavioral therapy. They're going to talk about medications. You know, there are so many different prescription medications that that help treat depression and other mental health disorders. But then on this same list, they're on every list, on every website that I looked at about depression or mental health issues, some things were listed. And those things that were repeated over and over again were regular exercise, sleep, avoiding alcohol, healthy diet, spending time with people that you care about. These are all listed as ways to at least lower your risk for developing depression. So again, when I'm looking at that circle of influence, I might not be able to, and there's no shame. There's no, oh, well, you shouldn't be depressed because you know you should be able to control it. No one is saying that. But when it comes to Now we're looking at obesity, diabetes, depression, these three things that are huge problems in our society. All of them have listed as ways that we can lower the risk, improve the outcome, maybe prevent, maybe reverse. All of these things are the things that are within our circle of control of these very simple behaviors that we listed at the very beginning of this podcast. Getting enough sleep, daily movement, controlling our food environment, what I buy at the grocery store, which restaurant I choose to go to for lunch, or maybe I bring my own food. Knowing that you can't completely control most things, but we can influence so many of the major issues plaguing our society, we get to decide then, what kind of attitude am I going to have when it comes to my own life? Am I going to be a proactive person or a reactive person? Now, if you're as old as I am, you probably remember Stephen Covey and the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He was somebody who talked about proactive people versus reactive people. Proactive people, they work on things that they can do something about. The nature of their energy is positive, enlarging, and magnifying. These are quotes from him. Reactive people focus on weaknesses of other people. They focus on the problems in the environment, the circumstances over which they have no control, they're, they focus on result. They focus results, blaming and accusing attitudes, and increased feelings of victimization. They focus on it's not my fault, it's my genes, it's my parents, it's my job, it's my the, all the things that are outside of their control. As opposed to okay, all of those things are true. What can I do? What are some things that I can do, or what? How can I change my attitude about this? And we all have a tendency, again, maybe it's human nature, to lie to ourselves about how much control we actually have and how much things are not our fault and how there's nothing we can do. I am notorious for this. This morning, I was like complaining nonstop. I was going to be late to prepping for this podcast because my children were being out of control. And I spent 10 minutes on the phone with Julian, my husband, complaining about it, which just made me 10 minutes more late. Do you understand how ridiculous that is? But we all have a tendency to do that. CrossFit, which is um, where I come from. I worked for CrossFit for eight years. I have a, both myself and my husband, Julian, the founders of Street Parking, used to compete in CrossFit. And a lot of our messaging and a lot of our belief system here at Street Parking comes from CrossFit. And CrossFit has a really cool way of talking about health. They created what's called the sickness, wellness, fitness continuum. And on one side of this kind of arch, it's everything that would be considered an unhealthy or sick individual. And and all of it can be measured, right? In the middle is going to be, oh yeah, you're, you're well. Everything that your doctor's like, 
your average, your average, on the other side is going to be fit or extremely healthy. At street parking, we aim for overall health and wellness, which requires us to move all measurable health and fitness markers and even mental health toward that fit side, toward that extremely healthy side. And the good news is we can measure most of these things to see where we're at and the direction that we're headed. Now, the goal when we start talking about measurement and accountability is not to compare yourself to someone else. Again, remembering that just because you live the exact same lifestyle and you do the same training program and you do the same type of nutrition as your friend at work or your next door neighbor doesn't mean your outcomes are going to be exactly the same. However, um, the goal, so the goal isn't to compare it to anyone else. We're going to let go of the outcomes. And the point of the measurement is to own our own reality. You are dealt a hand of cards. And instead of worrying about what other cards people have, you look at the cards in your hand and you do the best that you can with that. Now, If I never look at the cards, I don't know what kind of hand I've been dealt. So these measurements, these things that we can go out and measure, it can feel scary. It can feel judgy almost, but that's not what we're after here. And remember also that one single card means nothing. It's the hand of cards together. So what we encourage our members to do is get some objective measurements, but not to focus on one single data point because that doesn't tell the whole story. Um, And let's talk about what some of these objective measurements are. And we encourage you guys to say, all right, I'm going to see where I'm at, and I'm going to regularly measure these things to see where I'm headed and to see if I'm doing what I can to control, to influence as much as possible my overall health and fitness. The number one easiest thing for us to measure that people have been doing for such a long time, the the go-to is your weight. Okay, so I know that there's a, there's a lot of conversation out there in the interwebs about weight and about if it matters. And so I'm going to give you some of the research that I looked up so that this is not my opinion. This is coming from some medical doctors. Is it possible to be overweight and healthy? Dr. Silvana Panane, and I don't know if I said that right, said, yes, you can be overweight and metabolically healthy. And right now, in our culture, that's kind of where the conversation stops, and then we move on. But there's more to add to that. At the same time, we know that obesity is a disease that affects the body in many different ways. 13 types of cancer and 200 other health conditions are related to obesity. The relationship between obesity and other diseases is complex, and there are many unknowns. So if you're the type of person that's like, well, you know, you can be obese and, and healthy. She's saying that can be true, but how can we predict which individuals with obesity will be affected by all these other things, these 200 other health conditions and these, thir- cer- these 13 other types of cancers? We have treatments or lifestyle for factors that can influence obesity. Why would you wait and see if you're one of the lucky ones that can be healthy and obese at the same time, because it is not common. There are many reasons why some people have trouble losing weight. Often obesity results from inherited physiological and environmental factors combined with diet, physical activity, and exercise choices. Oh, this is from the, the Mayo Clinic. I also liked this one, though. Does weight on the scale matter? Dr. Mustafa Hussein said, the number on the scale is one data point. And this is where we're going to get into other types of measurements. It is part of a bigger picture. He says, I believe in body positivity, but at the same time, I also want to be real with my patients. Those numbers directly correlate to life expectancy. If you're 50 pounds overweight, your likelihood of dying for any cause is twice as high as somebody who is not overweight. If you're 100 pounds overweight, it's three times higher. We want to be supportive and give people options, but we also don't want to shy away from something that's as serious a problem as cancer. When we're looking at these objective measurements, and I wanted to start with weight because it seems to be the one 
that um, there's a lot of emotion tied to it. There's a lot of shame around it. People don't want to know how much they weigh. They don't. And listen, if you have some sort of past eating disorder or trauma around knowing your, your weight and all of that, this message might not be for you. But with all of these things, there can be some level of emotion or shame. What we've encouraged, and we've had meetings here at, at, at staff meetings here at Street Parking, is to not look at it as a measure of you as your worth as a human being. It is a data point. It is a piece of information. None of these should be viewed as anything other than that. It doesn't define who you are as a person or whether you're a failure. But we also believe when when we're talking about accountability that refusing to look at the cards that we're dealt, refusing to see where we're at, really puts a hindrance and we're burying our head in the sand for reality. And accountability requires you to live in reality. So one of those objective measurements is your weight. There's more than that though, and we would never encourage you to only look at that one thing. Actually, it's a huge problem in the health and fitness industry that people um, put all of their success and failure in the number on the scale. It's one data point that does not tell the whole story. Another thing that you can look at and measure, therefore, that's more accurate than your weight and tells a bigger picture is something like a body composition test. Here recently at Street Parking, our staff, we had the, uh, our friends over at Apex Power in Portland drive their DEXA scan machine up. They have like a DEXA scan machine in a van. They drove up here and I think like 15 or 20 people had a body composition te- test with the DEXA scan. A DEXA scan will measure your lean body mass. That's how much your body weighs if you take strip all of the fat off of it how much fat mass you have, your bone density, visceral fat, which is like the unhealthy like fat around your organs. So that is going to give you a much more clear picture of what that weight number even means. Because we all know that there are problems with the BMI. You can have a man who's 200 pounds and 180 pounds of that is lean body mass. He's got a lot of muscle mass. Or a man who's 200 pounds and it's mostly fat. Those two people are not the same level of health their health markers are probably not going to be the same. Their performance markers are not going to be the same. So weight doesn't tell the whole story. It's just really easy to measure and keep track of. Some other objective measurements, performance is a huge one. So again, looking at that sickness, wellness, fitness continuum, the stuff that we've talked about so far, if I am 50% fat or if I'm 100 pounds overweight, I'm going to be over on that edge of unhealthy borderline sick. I'm at a risk for a lot of things. If I'm in the middle there, maybe I'm, you know, 30% fat or I'm 30, 40 pounds overweight or something like that. I'm well, my doctor might not say anything. They would be like, yeah, you're cool. You're average. You're not at risk on, on, you know, the scary side. Keep doing what you're doing. But our goal is to get our members to come as close to fit or extremely healthy as possible. And so all of these objective measurements can go somewhere on that scale. Performance is a, is a really cool measurement because we're not just trying to make people's um, look a certain way, right? Or they're, we're not focused solely on body composition. It's how is this impacting my quality of life? How am I going to be when I'm 60, 70, 80 years old? And that is largely going to come down to what can I still do at those ages, not what do I look like. And while your um, body composition plays into that, we encourage our members to test and retest workouts. And we set them up for success here at Street Parking to do that. So right now, um, as I'm recording this, it's we're in the middle of March. And this month, we've programmed three of our diagnostic workouts that we, these are workouts that we've tested across you know, a bunch of different people and assigned levels to, hey, if you're able to do this workout in this amount of time with this weight, you're a level two. If you're able to pass the workout in this amount of time with this weight, you're actually crushing it, you're level four. And again, your worth is not tied to it. It's like, well, let me realistically see where I'm at. And so we, we programmed three of those into our um, programming our daily workouts this month, but those can be accessed by our street parking members at any time to test and retest, go back and work on the weaknesses and, and, and go see if they've improved. It's also why we repeat the vault workouts on the second half of the year. So January one, you do vault workout number one. And then what is it? 
July, first week of July, that workout six months later is repeated again. And if you've been consistent, you should see an improvement, whether you're able to use more weight, you're able to do the workout faster. So measuring performance in different areas, your mile time versus your, what you're able to lift versus whether or not you can jump on a box, all of those things. And performance doesn't always have to be in the gym too. It's like, hey, I noticed I'm less tired when I'm um, chasing my kids around. I was able to carry my kid around the amusement park without getting tired. And last year, that was not possible for me. Or the flip side can happen. Again, it's not all sunshine and roses. I used to be able to do X, and now I can't. And at some point in our lives, there's going to be a decline. Let's be realistic here. But can we prevent that stuff from happening? Can we build a buffer? You can look at things like your resting heart rate, your blood pressure. Your, we encourage our members to, to do regular blood work. So testing things like your fasting glucose, your insulin, your triglycerides, all of those regular health markers that your doctor would look at. Take a look at all those things. All of them should be moving toward the healthier side. So it doesn't matter where you're starting, but what we're looking at is going back to my circle of control, how can I move those things in the right direction? Your nutrition. We encourage you guys to keep, our members to keep a food log. And again, it's like, write down everything that you eat, even the handful of peanut M&Ms that you have that's at your coworker's desk every time you walk by. Write it down, be honest brutally honest. You don't have to show it to anyone. You don't have to share it with anyone. But until you know what you are doing now, you can't then exercise your circle of control to change anything because you're choosing to bury your head in the sand. So start with keeping a food log, know what you eat, how much, and so you can start to make improvements. And then within our community, we try to provide as many tools and opportunities as possible to make change in very simple ways. So we've got the 800 gram challenge that we've just released and the balanced plate challenge. We've got all sorts of recipes and things like that here in street parking. Because again, for most people, what we eat, what we buy at the grocery store is largely within our control. And I don't think I need to repeat it again, has a huge impact on our overall health and well-being. There are some some more subjective measurements that it's going to be hard for you to put a number to, but I think are important to mention and will be impacted by the circle of control and the circle of influence behaviors that we are implementing in our lives. And so I don't want to not mention them. Things like our mood, our relationships can be improved, our our energy levels can be improved, sleep and creativity. And there's, there's more than that, but those are the ones that I wrote. I think that those are important because one of the things that I used to say when I worked for CrossFit, when we would talk about that sickness, wellness, fitness continuum, is that quality of life and your joy, your joy in life matters. So I used to say, like, if you are the most beautiful, most fit, you're like, go to the CrossFit games and you win every single event and you can also, like, go do a triathlon and win that and you're just, like, gorgeous and... um you, everything's perfect. Blood markers are all perfect. DEXA scan is, is beautiful. And you're just like this specimen of a, of a human body, but you're, you're always in a bad mood. You have no friends and your wife left you. Um, <laughs> you don't sleep well, which would make it hard to do the rest of that stuff, but there's no joy in your life. Then everything that you're doing to create that beautiful specimen of a body is too far. It's too much. And that's where we want to find the balance, each of us as individuals. And this stuff is part of health. We, we believe at Street Parking that you cannot separate mental health from physical health. It's all just health. So where, where those things are harder to measure, we can pay attention to it. And we should. Maybe journal about it, I guess. Um, to kind of to close up, I wanted to share a story uh, <clears throat> that many of you have probably heard. But back in 2012, I was in a really gnarly car accident. And this was... Uh, a month, about a month or a couple weeks after I had just competed in the CrossFit regional competition, I had a lot of muscle mass. I mean, I still have a good amount of muscle mass, but I had more muscle mass back then. I was training actively to compete. My whole life revolved around that. And so I was dialed in with my nutrition, my lifestyle, all of that. And um, what happened was I was in this car accident where I broke my C2 vertebrae in what's called a hangman's fracture. So 
the reason that it's called that very graphically is because it's what breaks when people are hung or when they hang themselves and um, paralyzes their body from that portion down, which is C2, so it's very high. I had a, a unstable hangman's fracture. I was taken into the hospital, and even though I was complaining of neck pain and I was brought in on a spine board and everything, uh, there was no testing done on my neck. There was no x-ray, no MRI, and they sent me away with a broken hand and a, and a soft cast on my hand and said, um, this, the pain in your neck that I was complaining about is whiplash. Here's some pain medication prescription, and it'll, it'll get better. Well, for the next 17 days, I walked around in the most excruciating pain outside of my births that I've experienced in my life thinking, well, this is whiplash. This is what it feels like. And I was like, well, I'm going to do what's in my circle of control to feel better, which I know how the human body works. And if you just sit around, it tends to get more sore. So my goal was to move. And so I was going on hikes. I was like doing air squats and, um, you know, pulling a sled and I ran a 5k. I was working on the broadcast team at the CrossFit games thinking, well, if I sit still, it's just going to get worse. 17 days later, my hand doctor said, you should not still be this sore from whiplash. There's something wrong with your neck. And he sent me in for an x-ray, told me, okay, that looks weird, but I can't tell what's going on. Sent me in for an MRI. The MRI technician calls me and says to me, you need to go to the emergency room right now because you should be paralyzed. And if you are rear-ended, if you trip and fall, if somebody like nudges you the wrong way and that thing moves, you could be paralyzed for the rest of your life. I had to have emergency surgery that night and the doctors who have looked at it and, and CrossFit actually did a documentary about this whole thing because it was crazy, um, focusing on that sickness, wellness, fitness continuum. The doctor said, I've never seen a break like this where the person wasn't at least paralyzed, if not killed. And I walked around like that for 17 days. And what the common phrase that I heard after the fact about this from so many people was, you're so lucky. You're so lucky. And the truth is, I am lucky. I am blessed. But the truth is, those things that I was controlling in my life to have the muscle mass that I have and to have a body that was resilient to that type of injury was not luck at all. It was my, and I'm going to be honest and clear. I was not training to survive a car accident. There was no thought in my mind when I was training back then that it's like, I'm going to make myself bulletproof so that if I get in a car accident, I'm going to be, that was not a thought in my mind. But ever since that has happened, and I understand that the reason that I am not paralyzed or wasn't killed in that accident is because of the amount of muscle mass that I have on my body and because of the lifestyle that I was living, it flipped a switch in my mind as a trainer. And since then, it has been my goal and my mission to help as many people as possible move as many of those measurable health markers away from the sick side toward the super healthy, super fit side as possible, because what it will do for us is create a resilient human being who has a buffer against all the things that life will inevitably throw at us. We're going to give ourselves the best possible chance of having a high quality of life and surviving all of these things that life will eventually throw at us, which is going to be different for all of us. And we're all going to have different outcomes from the lifestyle, but we can all control them much more than we want to believe. I'll leave you with this, which is just street parking's um, core value write up for accountability. No one is coming to save you. Your life is 100% your responsibility. At street parking, we believe in controlling what we can control. And we know that we are able to control a lot more than most people want to admit. We know that blaming others, our genetics, or our current circumstances for all of our problems is a waste of time. We seek ways that we can respond to or improve our situation. 
even if those actions are small, even if it's just reframing the way we look at things until we're better able to take action. At Street Parking, we take ownership of our fitness, our nutrition, our daily choices, our attitude, and our lives. I hope you guys have a great day. Make sure you share this podcast with anyone that you think might benefit from it. Let us know what you think, and we'll see you next time.